Hello. Have we started? Okay, we've started. Great. Thanks for coming to this talk. I noticed there were some great talks happening in the other sessions right now. Um, Danish EV infrastructure, super exciting. So, had to be here and not in there. So, today in here, I'll be talking about architecture modernization. Uh, before I get into the talk, I guess I'll just explain a few things about myself. This talk's going to be about my perspective of modernization. You might have some different opinions and different experiences. So basically, I've done this as a full-time employee. Last five years, I've been a consultant, so consultant's perspective here. But not one of those big consultants who comes in with a framework and tells you exactly what to do and all that stuff, um, working in a small group of people. Um, I wrote a book about architecture modernization, so I'm kind of bored of talking about it to myself in the mirror. It's actually great. Now I've actually got some ideas I can come and talk to other people about. And uh, I'm also the co-organizer of DDD London Meetup. Uh, trying to do meetups every month, trying to give people a chance to get together in person and connect. So if you're in London, please drop by. If you want to give a talk, happy to host you. Um, if you've never done a talk before, happy to have people doing their first time talks. So yeah, open invitation. Let's get into the talk then. So if you're a company, why would you consider architecture modernization? You're a successful company. Um, why would you spend some time messing around with old legacy systems when you can build new features? Is it just developers who want to play with the latest tech, or is there any actual reason for modernization? Think about, think about a big company. You know, we laugh at big companies sometimes, um, established companies, not necessarily big. Some serious advantages to being a big company. You've got market share. You're making money. You've got customers who know your brand. There's loyalty to your brand. People use your products. They become accustomed to using your products. Even if your competitors build a better product, because people know you, there's a, there's a switching cost there, a mental one, and also on a technical level, migrating all of their data and their users from all of your products to other products. There's a lot of effort involved in a big company doing that for your whole, all of your employees. It's a lot of effort, so because you got there first, people might stick with your product even if a competitor has a product that's better than yours. You've also got big budgets. You, know, you can pay the top salaries. These startups don't have as much money, so they have to find other ways to entice people to come and work for them. But as we all know, being successful has a number of drawbacks. In, in this kind of context, we think about legacy software, legacy systems, get stuck in the mud, impossible to make changes, slows companies down, but we also have problems on an organizational side, bureaucracy, red tape. I'd like to add a new library to my project that helps to do something like logging or something else in a much simpler way. Well, you need to get securities approval, and they said already said no, so you're going to have to use some library from five years ago that's been approved, and they're not willing to approve anymore. So, you know, all these rules and red tape, bureaucracy, builds up over time, and it being a successful company, all these, all these things trying to pull you back. Plus, you get stuck on old technologies. It's not possible to just take an old system, click your fingers, and have it running on the latest frameworks and the latest cloud infrastructure. So, it gets difficult to change that over time. And so, because of all of these reasons, smaller companies, younger companies, they have an advantage now. They can use the latest tech. They don't have legacy holding them back. They don't have all of this bureaucracy that's built up. So being a big company has some advantages, but obviously many disadvantages. And a company, I could talk about some bad examples here, companies that you know, didn't take the warning signs, but that's boring. A good example is OpenTable. Uh, my friend Orlando Perry, going back about 10 years ago now, he, he worked there. I know some other people who worked there as well. Basically, big monolithic code base, hadn't been particularly well designed. It's got 100 engineers all working in there, deploying it once a month, lots of merge conflicts, lots of, lots of uh, friction just to implement features. What OpenTable recognized, both on a technical level and a product level, is that they could actually see their competitors entering the industry, moving quickly, adding new features. And this company realized, if we don't modernize, 
were probably going to fall behind the competition. So they invested in modernization. Around about a year later, and they hired a lot of smart people to help with this. It's not just, you know, it's not an easy thing to do this. Um, and, you know, bigger companies, it might take much longer than one year. Um, but within about a year later, OpenTable had a bunch of independent teams all deploying to production multiple times per day. And they were ahead of the competition in their abilities to move at speed. Sorry about that. Something else that's important, why companies need to modernize, it's not always a case of we, may, we took loads of shortcuts, we built up loads of technical debt, you know, we, we did this to ourselves. Even if you make good decisions, even if every architectural decision you make is perfect, something might change in the future, and suddenly a decision you made back then, based on things that made sense then, suddenly is not optimal anymore. So modernization is hard to avoid, even if you make good decisions. Good example here is Vinted, as Ornello explains. They were struggling to implement new features, finding it very difficult. One of the key reasons was they built a system around the idea of being active in one vertical. Women's clothing. I know nothing about women's clothing or any clothing. It's not my topic. But the point is quite obvious here. They designed a system, every, every code concept, Hope that's not for me. Um, basically, the whole system had been designed around women's clothing. Obviously, as the company became successful, the company wants to grow into other verticals, probably other things I know nothing about. And so now they're trying to build these features onto a code base that's got abstractions that were not anticipating this kind of evolution. So that's the kind of challenges we face. Even if you make good decisions, at some point, modernization is often inevitable, not always. Um, you know, so when I think about modernization, what I think about and in my experiences, it's established companies who are starting to feel the pain of the legacy they've built up. They're starting to feel some competition in their market, and they want to convert these old architecture and their old ways of working into something more modern that allows them to compete with these fast-moving companies. Effectively, they want the best of both worlds. Be a successful company, well-known brand, market share, big budgets, but able to innovate at speed as well. So in this talk today, I'm going to cover this topic from three different angles. The first one is about flow, about how quickly we can get work done in our company. As you've seen in these examples, when people modernize their architecture, it's usually because work isn't getting done fast enough. So talk about that. Then I'll quickly touch on five different tools, which I think are essential in an architecture modernization journey, you might disagree. That's good. I'm open to disagreement. And then finally, last part of today's talk, I'm going to touch on the getting started and keeping a modernization journey moving. That's where a lot of modernization journeys fall apart, before they've got started or just after they've got started. Everyone's got great ideas. Everyone's keen to modernize, but you know, Someone doesn't make a decision or some other work comes in and then modernization gets pushed to the side and you, you're back where you were before, you haven't really made any progress. So I'll share a couple of techniques which I think are really effective in that area. But no silver bullets here. I'm not saying if you do all the stuff in this talk, it will guarantee success. I think it will increase your chances. So let's talk about flow. And before talking about that specifically, um, I want to address the point that a lot of these conversations around modernization talk about technology change, using some, moving from COBOL to something more modern, moving from on-premises to the cloud, moving from VMs to something more serverless or container-based. Well, that's important. If you only focus on those things, you won't get the benefits of modernization, the full benefits. Because think about your system now. You've got and the Vinted example touched on this, your system doesn't have the optimal design. Changing the technology won't fix all of the coupling and the bad design and the shortcuts in your system. So technology is one part, but modernization needs a broader scope than that. So if companies are investing in modernization because flow is important in a modern context, then we need to, we need to have this as the building blocks of our architecture. 
And that's basically what value streams are. A value stream is a sequence of activities that a team will go through, or multiple teams, or some group of people, to create some new kind of value. You all probably work in teams. You're all probably part of one or more value streams. What can we build? Let's have an idea. Let's find some ideas. Let's prioritize stuff. Let's define some requirements. Let's implement it. Let's test it. Let's deploy it. And then in a modern context, fast flow means doing that all, all in short increments, multiple times per day. So deploying small chunks every day. So if we think about value streams, we're on the right track. We're keeping flow in mind. We're not being driven by tech. We're being driven by flow, what's important to the business. But the problem is just thinking about value streams isn't enough. Even if we design value streams and we have software which is aligned to these value streams, we still have to worry about change coupling. Change coupling is basically on a business level or product level, we want to implement some new feature. The problem is we need multiple teams, each to implement some part of this. So now this change coupling means we've got team coordination. Teams have to spend some time figuring out which team will build which piece, how will we design the interfaces between our different parts. Oh, this team's got other work in their backlog, so they're not fully focused on this. These teams don't agree about the best way to implement it. So all this having to coordinate teams, it takes much more effort than one team implementing a feature. I, I will say that we can't get, avoid all change coupling, but the goal is let's identify as much as we can that can be removed and, and design for that. So I think what we need to focus on are independent value streams. Independent, as I was just touching on, doesn't mean isolated. There will be some coupling, but if we follow these four guiding principles or these four characteristics, I think we can get much closer to highly independent value streams. So the first one is about being domain aligned. General idea here is, if we want loosely coupled software and we want to avoid change coupling between teams, then we need to start by identifying which parts of our business can evolve independently. When we get a new requirement, what are the parts of the business involved in that? In DDD, we call those subdomains. We organize our business into domains and subdomains. So that's the first step. The second part is then thinking about the outcomes. What are the business outcomes that this value stream is contributing to? Outcomes are important for a few different reasons. I guess the first one is we want to understand how important is this value stream with respect to our overall architecture, our overall portfolio. What's good enough here? What level of flow is good enough here? What level of modernization is going to be good enough here? Outcomes are also important because it feeds into the next point about teams being able to make decisions and make changes. If teams have clear business outcomes like engagement, revenue, improving processing times, which we'll get to shortly, then teams can make decisions in the value stream without having a dependency outside the value stream. The alternative approach is a feature factory. We have these product people over here who define the requirements. A nice product requirements document gets handed over to the team. Team builds what they think they've been asked to build, but actually it's not what they've been asked to build. So we've got you know, some back and forth, some disagreement, teams guessing, teams not understanding the domain. So the outcomes can help the team make those decisions. The team can decide what they're going to build. They can own more decisions in that value stream. And then finally, we've got the software bit. If a team is able to actually t have ideas, choose what to build, then the final bit is actually, can they change the code, implement it in software, and deploy that software? So independent here means a team is able to implement a feature and deploy that feature on their own without needing any help or support from other teams. So, company that did this, another one of my friends. I've got a lot of, I've got a friends who make good choices in their careers. So this is a company called ICE. Uh, effectively, it's in the domain of royalty calculations. Uh, it's quite a very complex domain. My friend Casper works here. So when they set out on their modernization journey, this is one area of their business. As you can see, initially, they've got a system that's been designed in a very technical focus. As you can see, import-export system. Is that part of the business? Is that part of the domain? Or is that 
talking about the technical mechanics of how the software works and not really the intention behind it. System had a lot of coupling. Teams were quite big. Um, teams had to know about lots of different moving parts of the system, so cognitive load was high. Couldn't deploy very often. So, you know, not, not getting the benefits they wanted, not moving as quickly as they wanted. And so Casper and his colleagues um, took an approach where they started identifying their domains and subdomains, as you can see here, usage ingestion, matching, royalty calculation. They identified outcomes that they wanted to achieve on a business level. As you can see on the right-hand side, they were able to reduce their ingestion processing times by 80%, and the uh, matching process improved 5x. So they had clear business outcomes, and teams were able to work closely with domain experts, learn the domain they're working in, make decisions on a product level, and they were able to deploy changes independently. Each team was deploying um, on a very regular basis. One other thing I want to quickly talk about is this idea of just taking the old system and rewriting it in new tech. It's con concept of feature parity. This is also problematic. If you do this, you're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of money modernizing things that just don't need to be modernized. You don't just take an old system and rewrite it. You might do this with some parts of the system, but as an overall global strategy, I don't think I've ever seen this work well. And usually what happens is it takes so long, you never get to finish because people aren't seeing the value coming out of it. I'm not sure how accurate this survey is, but I think it gets the idea across nicely, right? Pendo did a survey, and they found that 80% of product features are rarely or never used. So if we take that as a guideline, if you modernize an old system and just rewrite it, maintaining exact feature parity, you're probably going to spend 80% of your time doing stuff that isn't needed. So what I like to think about is a full stack modernization. And I'm not just talking about the front end and back end frameworks. I'm talking the full stack in terms of your product and the capabilities it represents. So at the bottom layer, you've got the domain itself the business domain you're working in. Can you improve the domain? Can you introduce new capabilities? Can you simplify existing operational processes? Then you have the model of your domain. This is how you describe your domain, the, the language you use, the concepts you use to talk about your domain. By creating a richer domain model, you can have more effective communications, and this conceptual domain model can then be implemented in code, which is going to improve the design of your software. Obviously, when we talk about code, we can also improve it on the tech side of things. And then at the top of the stack, we've got the user interface. A lot of effort can be done here to improve the user experience. If you take an old system and rebuild it and keep the same UX, that is just a massive missed opportunity. Again, it might be, it might be sensible in some cases, but if you're going to modernize, at least take the effort to make some improvements to the UX. Example here from my career. I worked for the UK government in 2016, and we were modernizing the full stack of business property taxes. So some of the business policies, the, well, not business, government policies around how tax is calculated and how people pay it and what they're obliged to pay, it existed for decades. It was actually the law. These were government policies enshrined in law, and we were modernizing those. We were thinking, like, what would make sense here? We had domain experts and developers thinking what makes sense on a logical level and what can we do in software. Um, spent a lot of time on the domain talking about where the boundaries are, how we talk about the domain, trying to create this shared language. Um, massively modernized the software. Um, so very old systems, got them running on Java, on the JVM, on a Docker-based platform, uh, moving to more domain-driven architecture as well. And on a UX level, a lot of effort went into the UX. We had user researchers in each team going out every sprint, talking to real users. Developers would go as well to the research lab. So in this, in this particular context, it made sense to put all of that effort in. I'm not saying you would do this everywhere. What I'm saying is think about the full stack and at least be aware of what you could modernize. It's not just the technologies. There's a lot to think about here. So, if you agree or like or have that perspective on what modernization is, then I think there are some tools 
that you'll find very useful for that kind of modernization journey. And the first one is listening. What I mean by listening is, before you start talking about tech, going around, talking to people in your company, and just trying to understand what are the biggest problems you're facing? What are your ambitions for the next three to five years? What have you given up asking for? What would you love to do? What is keeping you up at night? Very often, when modernization starts out, talking about cloud and the latest tech, and the narrative gets shaped from there, people start equating it with a, mod a technology thing. And so other stakeholders don't feel connected. With this approach, you're doing it the other way around, just talking to people. It's actually, I found it really difficult to do that, actually. Um, but I, as a consultant, I got to do this a lot of times, and I kind of picked up some techniques. Um, I'm not very good at small talk. Something else I found really important about this, though, is if you start talking to people, just listening to what they have to say and not pushing solutions, you start to build relationships. So when it comes to making a decision, putting a proposal together, asking, can we modernize this, those people are much more likely to feel like, oh, I've got a relationship with that person. I'll support that. I'll give them some buy-in. They've listened to me. That The proposal takes into account my thoughts much more likely to get buy-in. Beginner mistake is obviously coming in too early with leading questions and solutions. Someone's got a problem about CRMs. You come in and say, oh, so Salesforce will fix all your problems. That's, you want to keep away from that at the start. Just being comfortable, not talking about solutions, just seeing where the conversation goes, and uh, gently moving things in, in different directions, just trying to tease out what's important to them different time horizons. And what I've, what I've noticed probably over the last couple of years, mostly I would say, the challenge I face mostly um, is, you know, modernization can get stuck because you can't make decisions. There's a lot of ideas. How do you choose the right idea? When you don't have clear business objectives, things can get stuck. People, developers might say, well, we could modernize that old part of the system. It's going to take six months or longer. Is it worth it? We don't know because we don't have clear business priorities. So a listening tool can help get clarity on those business priorities, which you can then use to justify your modernization decisions. Something else that's very useful is impact mapping. It's a bit more structured. So if you're not good at um, conversations like I wasn't, this can give you a bit more of a structure to work with. So you start with the business objectives. In this example, I was talking to a chief marketing officer. He explained to me, over the next couple of years, we have to, put 20, we have to increase our revenue by 20 million. It's important for the investors. It's important to maintain our growth. And then he started explaining to me how he thinks the company can achieve that. You'll talk to different stakeholders, and they'll give you different things. It's not like there's one list of priorities here. It's, it's a messy world, but at least you know what you could be working on and what some people feel is important. This example here, enterprise users, improving some of the processes, um, accuracy rates, and he talked about some deliverables that he thought could be useful in achieving that. So now, when we think about architecture modernization, are we making decisions that contribute to this? If we are, we're probably going to get buy-in and support we're probably modernizing for the right reasons. Next tool is Wardley mapping. So Wardley mapping, you start by creating value chains, not value streams, different things. A value chain starts with your users and their user needs. What have we got in this example? Um, a customer wants to enjoy some food without cooking, and they want some takeaway food. So that's your user, that's your need. You can then start thinking about what are your architectural components? What are the different parts of your system that fit together to enable these business and customer outcomes to be achieved? This example, we've got uh, the mobile app, the menu service, ordering service, payment service. I quite like microservices. I know it's not very popular right now, but I've had some fun over the years with them. So then you've built your value chain, not value stream, value chain. I often make that mistake myself. So didn't this time. So you've, you've mapped out your value chain. What you then do is move each component to a stage of evolution. Genesis, custom, product, or commodity. On the left, you've got Genesis. These are concepts on a business level 
that are new and unproven. There's high future potential, but that potential hasn't been realized yet. As you move across, ideas become more established in custom and products, an idea has been proven, and there's an opportunity for your business to differentiate on that feature. It's a place where um, competition's happening in your industry. As you get to commodity, we're now reaching the table stakes, the old features. Every company has it. Customers just expect it to work in a certain way. There's no chance for differentiation here. Why is this important? Because now you can make very sensible, strategically aligned modernization decisions. You know that towards the left, because there's a high potential for differentiation, you really want to have fast flow in those value streams. Towards the right-hand side in commodity, there's not much chance for differentiation on a feature level. So here, it's all about reducing costs. How can we make the cost of running that old legacy system cheaper? Could we use an off-the-shelf tool? Those are the typical kind of conversations happening in that space. Obviously, I'm simplifying a bit here, but hopefully you get the idea. But we're not finished yet. When you use a Wardley map to make modernization decisions, you don't make decisions based on the current position of a component. What you need to do is anticipate how is that component going to evolve over the next time frame. And that time frame is something you need to think about. One year, two year, three year, five years. What's happening in your industry? Are there a bunch of companies all trying to build this thing and they're going to catch up with you? Or is it something that's going to evolve slowly? You, know, you might want to think about where's, where are large language models on here right now. Would you think that's something that's going to evolve slowly? Or is it going to become a commodity very quickly? I think we can see some different aspects there. So in this example, we've got a component. It's going to evolve from custom to almost commodity in one year. So even though it's um, in custom now, we might originally think, oh, it's important to have differentiation here. We can modernize this to a high level and enable fast flow. But actually, in one year, it will be almost a commodity, and it will be much less important then. So we have a very short-term focus here, maybe a modernization that enables long-term fast flow, probably overkill in this area. Then we get to the next tool and my next drink break. I reckon I can get to the end from here without having any more drinks. Quite ambitious. So tool number four, event storming. Event storming comes in different flavors. Big picture is about mapping out your business as is. You get a bunch of stakeholders, developers, testers, product people, QA people, managers, customer support, anyone who knows anything about the part of your business you want to model, get them in a room. You map out your domain using domain events on a wall. You know, A room like this would be awesome for event storming. You could map out a, a massive part of your business on a wall like that. Once you've done this, you've now got a, a very granular view of your business. You can zoom in and zoom out as needed. And you can start to really get into the details of what problems are different people facing? Where are the challenges here? If we're going to modernize these processes, what should the new version look like? What's wrong with the current version that we wouldn't want to keep in the new world? Then you've got process modeling event storming. That is your new world. Before you start building the new system, you can use process modeling to redesign your domain, your user journeys, your workflows, and think about how would it work ideally in an ideal world? What will this process look like? Can we simplify it? Can we add new features? Can we automate manual steps? All that kind of stuff. And then this gives you a template for what the new version will look like when you start to implement the modernized version. Event storming is also a great tool for actually designing your architecture. Once you've mapped out a business, you can start to organize parts of the event storm into domains and subdomains, which are obviously the starting points for your value streams. Very useful for that. The fifth and final tool is the modernization strategy selector. Maybe the tool's not so important here, but the idea is important to keep in mind in your modernization journey. You need some way of assessing what level of effort are we going to put into each part of our system? And there's a couple of different axes to think about here. The first one is obviously the tech side, the platform side. Are we going to lift and shift an old code base from on-prem to the cloud? 
We'll change the infrastructure, but we'll leave all of the other tech as is. Um, or you're going to completely change the whole tech stack. And then the other aspect of this is the functionality side. Are you going to add new features to the code base? Are you going to simplify the old code base? Are you going to redesign the domain model? So two different axes to think about there. And the goal is always, what's going to be optimal? What's the optimal strategy here in each area of that architecture? It's not going to be a global strategy. We need to think granularly, what, what's the optimal investment in each area? And again, this is an area where some companies go a bit off track, taking global approaches, investing a lot of effort where it's not needed. Um, as I talked about, yeah, different, different levels to think about there. Um, you can read more about that later. I'm not going to talk about this tool, but I think there's a sixth tool that's really important. I'm seeing a lot more of this these days. It's called Code Scene. It's a tool that can analyze your architecture. It looks at your version control history, and it can visualize the coupling in your system. It can also visualize which parts of the system have no owner, where you've got knowledge gaps in your company. Very useful tool. So to finish today, I'm going to explain how you can kickstart and enable your architect's modernization journey. And I'm not going to have a drink before I finish. So why is this important? So it's important because as a consultant, I see things that I, I didn't realize were happening. So for example, a company will say, we, we've started mapping out all of our domains and subdomains. It's taken six months. How long should it take? Um, that's, a, that's big design up front, right? We don't want to do that. We need to be sensible here. We need to do some thinking up front, but we don't need to apply these techniques I told you across the whole system before you start modernizing. In fact, I'm very ambitious in the other direction. I really encourage companies try and deliver something in three to six months. Because once you start delivering, you start learning. Once you've actually delivered some modernization, people can see it's real. It's not just an idea anymore. And that builds, people start to believe it's going to work. And you can say, you're not saying to people, this modernization could be a great idea. Please support us. You're saying, look, we've delivered something. It worked. Give us some more money, and we'll give you some more of this good stuff. So you know, just delivering. You can still think about the big picture whilst you're delivering, but you know, just don't go too much in that upfront design phase. Some kind of tool can be useful here. Here's a general kind of concept I use. You know, what's the value of modernizing something, and what's the effort of doing it? Um, typically, that first slice is going to be a difficult choice between do we pick something that's easy to modernize, where we can test out some ideas, or do we pick something that's a bit more difficult, but it's got a high level of business value in there? I've got no... I've got no single answer here because I think it varies. I've seen both of these work and both of these go wrong. If you start with something simple in the bottom left, you don't have so much pressure. Um, you can test out new tech and you can go at your own pace and try out things. It's not a problem if you fail or if you have to change some decisions. The problem is people start asking questions. Why are you spending six months modernizing that part of the system that no one cares about? So people can start thinking that modernization doesn't have value. It's a tech-driven thing. So if you're going down that approach, you know, owning that narrative is very important. It needs to be clear that it's the first step in a longer vision. And while it's not a valuable first step, it's paving the path for more valuable steps later. Some companies go towards the top right. They pick something big and valuable and important. That gets people excited. People are more likely to invest in something if they're going to get something back on a business level. But the problem is, because you're just starting out, there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of things to experiment with. And if you say, we're going to modernize this part of the system, and we're going to deliver some new functionality, and you put a deadline on that, if you say three or six months, you know, any number of issues could pop up, networking issues, product issues, prioritization issues, and suddenly, this doesn't get delivered on time because of all these unknowns that are likely to happen. People get a bit frustrated. Um, and they think, oh, it's, it's a waste of effort. So, yeah, it's a tricky decision, but I think you know, mapping out the options and having those conversations and being explicit is the way to go. Something else I think is very useful are Kickstarter workshops. Kickstarter workshops are basically three to five days in person, 
and the idea is to set yourself up for that first slice of modernization. So typically, what the topics will look like here are someone from the product, someone from the business side will talk about the strategy. You'll then do some event storming. You'll then clarify the options. And then towards the end of the workshop, you want to start defining a short-term roadmap or a plan so that when this workshop is over, you're going to start modernizing. The goal of this workshop isn't just to get together and have some fun. It's really get modernization moving. Make some decisions, make a plan, and start modernizing. Um, as, a, as I mentioned here, I think these workshops are great because they get people excited. You know, that people come together, do some event storming. I often hear comments like, oh, we've never done this before. It makes it feel more real. This example here was from a company, me, myself, myself and Eduardo de Silva worked with um, a bit earlier this year. The picture you can see is the end of day one. We had 60 people, probably a bit too much. Um, that's a different conversation. Uh, here's Eduardo's group. As you can see, they mapped out this end-to-end -end process. And if you, if you look closely, you can see that there are some yellow strips going across the top, and those are the subdomains. And, and really, when you get a workshop like that, you bring together these different stakeholders who normally work in different silos. You've got the CEO there, the COO there, and they're like, wow, this company's never done anything like this before. It can be really motivating and exciting and getting people pumped up for your modernization journey. But the workshop doesn't guarantee anything. And very often, people have good workshops, but then they get stuck. So how do you go from this exciting workshop to let's actually get modernizing? No silver bullets here, but one of the techniques we recommend is an architecture modernization enabling team. If you've read Team Topologies, you'll know that an enabling team is a team that has a mission to help other teams, help them achieve goals, help them to upskill. An enabling team isn't a team. It's not a centralized architecture team. It's not a team that makes decisions. It's not a team that does the architecture work and hands it over to teams. It's a team that it's a team that works with other teams to help them achieve those goals. And AMET can connect CTO and developers, maintaining that vertical connection. It can also look for gaps falling between teams. So if you're thinking about setting up an AMET, you have to be very careful here. You don't want to put people in this team who are architecture experts, but they're not good at coaching and talking to other people. It's a very, it's a very specific kind of skill that's needed, both expertise and being able to work and support other people in a, in a coaching fashion. And the final point, as you can see here, is an AMET isn't supposed to exist forever. They're here to get things started, help teams to be self-sufficient, and then they're gone. They find some other purpose in life. So that's basically it. I do want a drink, but I'm not going to have one because we're almost at the end now. So I'm just going to quickly recap. You know, modernization, successful companies. There are pros and cons to being successful, right? You've got these advantages. You've got success. You've got a brand reputation. Sometimes that's enough to keep you as the market leader. But very often, a lot of the legacy you've built up over time becomes too much of a disadvantage, and it makes you vulnerable. So that's why companies modernize. They want to be a successful, established company, but they know that they have to innovate faster because their industry is hotting up. Then talked about how modernization is more than tech. You know, very often, as I talked about, modernization starts with a technology narrative, and it's hard to get that back to, this is about moving the business forward. This is about transforming the business capabilities, not just on the tech side. Talked about the full stack. I think that full stack model is important to keep in mind. How much of that stack do you want to modernize for each part of your system? Then talked about the five essential tools. Maybe you don't have to use these exact tools. You can find similar tools, but each of these tools solves a very specific purpose and is, a, is something that you have to be thinking about when you're modernizing. And then finally, you just talked about not getting lost up front. A lot of companies get stuck before they get started, do too much upfront planning, and that's where having a focus of three to six months, a really ambitious focus, and Kickstarter workshops and AMETs can help you if you're feeling some inertia there. So that is everything, and I am allowed to have a drink now. Thank you.